Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Well, how are you? Good morning. Welcome online if you're joining in with us. I know a number of you are because of the snow. I guess it does snow in Virginia Beach. You know, some of us, we have like SUVs, we have four-wheel drives, uh, all-wheel drive, and we have all that power and nothing to do with it. This was the moment. It's like we wait for sometimes like years. Hey, finally, I paid extra money for this, and look, I get to use it. Well, you know, um, uh, it's pretty expensive to to hire one of the uh, uh, plows to come out, and we only have like 80 spots or something like that, so uh, I, we just kind of threw out a, uh, something to our dream team. Our volunteers said, hey, anybody who can come and help us shovel a little bit, we were going to create some spaces. I was thinking maybe we'd create like a little uh, walkway from, you know, from the parking lot in. We had 35 people show up yesterday shoveling. Here's, here's a couple photos of that. That's what it looked like. You could see that it wasn't really going to work all that well. Anyways, we had 35 people. We had music playing, we eating donuts and having fun, talking, getting to know each other a lot better. And, and so they created what you saw, how it was real easy to get in. It's just, I love working with, uh, alongside with people, serving. It's amazing. That's our dream team. Speaking of our dream team, I wanted to recap a few things uh, for 2017. Uh, our dream team, we had... Uh, 173 people this year in 2017 join our dream team. That means they went through growth track and they said, uh, yeah, we want to be part of something that makes a difference and, and just serve in many different ways. Here's some of the highlights that the ways we serve our food pantry, our true bread. Those are two compassion based ministries that we have in our church where we serve food and other things, but mostly food. And we fed over 2,800 people this past year, we, as well as handed out clothing, household items. And in some of those, uh, uh, in one of those ministries in, in True Bed, we go into some of the low-income housing areas, and we not only feed them, but share, uh, pray for people, give testimonies. And then we also invite them to receive Christ. We had 35 people come to Christ uh, in, in some of those low-income housing. People that don't come to our church, we go to them. During the holiday season, we had 50 families that got uh, Christmas gifts, Christmas baskets. We had hundreds and hundreds of toys given out to kids. Uh, we also do a back-to-school backpack where we get backpacks and we fill them with supplies. And then we have adopted two schools, again, in kind of more suppressed, economically suppressed neighborhoods. We had 70 book bags filled with supplies. We gave them to them. In our small groups, we had 270 people in our small groups. Our online campus, at the beginning, a, a year ago today, we had about 100 or 400 people uh, a, a, a week watching uh, with us online. That's grown from 400 a week to 2,000 a week. It's also expanded uh, to a number of countries. Not 193 countries uh, are participating in that, mostly from the U.S., but, I mean, all over the world, pretty, pretty amazing. We had 74 baptisms last year. We had 180 adult uh, commitments to Christ, 90 uh, youth commitments to Christ, and 95 um, children put their faith in Christ. So, you know, it's exciting. And these are some of the things that we do that we say when we join together, we can make a difference. And that's what I wanted to do today, uh, this weekend. We're just going to pause on the series. We'd like to do a lot of series because we uh, see that there's a lot of different needs and we try to address them and rotate around. But once a year, we try to stop and just take a moment and say, why are we doing this again? What's the big picture? You know, what's the vision? This is important. Visions are a big deal, you know. I mean, you might be familiar with that verse in the King James Version that says, where there is no vision, people perish. Now, I put that, that, uh, that verse in your outline, if you can read along with me. There, Proverbs 29, 18. In the message, it says this. If people can't see what God's doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. In other words, you don't have clarity. When you, you, you start to veer off, you get distracted easily. We all do. Vision leaks. We can have clear, crystal clear vision, and after a few months, <clears throat> it can start to leak. We can start to get fuzzy on that. 
you know? And we start to think, why are we doing what we're doing again? Why is this important? Are we really making a difference? So that's what today is about, is refocusing, looking at our vision. I put the vision on your outline. You can read it. See, the, our vision, a little different than our mission, <clears throat> our vision is that lost people get saved, saved people get pastored, pastored people get trained, and trained people get mobilized. So we're going to kind of unpack that a little bit today. And, um, and, and, I, and I, it's important that we kind of get the whole thing. We're going to look at that and kind of, you know, step by step, what, what each part of that vision, what it means. So to begin with, though, our vision talks about lost people being saved. In other words, it all begins with knowing God. So I have my, I want to just write here, know, to know God. So this is talking about more than just head knowledge. It's more than like taking a test. You know, we've all been in school and, you, you know, probably the easier tests generally are true and false, right? And you get a true and false, you get 50-50 at least, right? And you think, well, I got it, you know. So saying, I believe in God, that's not exactly, that's not what the Bible teaches is that it's just a true or false. Yes, it, God invites us into a relationship. He invites us into something more. That's why he states time and time again, he's a living God. A living God, in other words, there's, a living God means there's a relationship. Certainly something different than that, something that's dead. And so he invites us in to a close uh, relationship where we can talk to him, we communicate, we listen. He guides us, he directs us. He moves us, and there's something just unique about that. And that's, so this is an important part. We invite people, part of our vision is saying we want everybody to know God in that way. We want them to know God, to have that so the lost are saved. Now, once you know God, the next thing is to go through this process in, in, in the, uh, over the years, they've called it sanctification, but it's really called, it's just finding freedom. To find freedom. <coughs> So to find freedom is really important. And so we have hang-ups, we have habits, we have things that we uh, wish we did that we don't do. Uh, we behave ways that we're ashamed of. Not only do these, we do things that we're disappointed of, but we also, we know, have disappointed God. And so it's, it's, we're far from where we need to be. And it frustrates us. And so God invites us into that. Now see, here's the thing. Some people think, well, before I can know God, I need to find freedom. I need to get rid of those things those that, that I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing. I need to, you know, I need to break free from that addiction. I can't, I can't come to God like that. But here's the thing is you actually can't be free until you know God. God's the one who gives us the power to be free. And so this is the order of it. We know God. The lost are saved. And then part of being pastored is it doesn't mean that you're going to be a pastor. It means that uh, our pastor is the good shepherd. In Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in need of anything. I shall not want. So this is, God is inviting us into a place where, we, where we're freed from that, where we, we, we get freed. So uh, not being trapped, not being hopeless. Now, the next part, of course, is uh, this part of being trained, discovering my purpose. So I have, <clears throat> I have a purpose. Discover my purpose purpose. And this is all part of, 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 of d is this, this step in the vision. Y it goes in order. First, I need to know God. But see, if I'm looking at yesterday, if I'm caught up all in yesterday, I can't move towards my tomorrow. I can't get what God has for me. And so this is an important process that we, God helps fr free us. And then once we're free, we can start to know, oh, I get it. This is what I'm here for. This is my gifts. This is what I'm supposed to do with my life. And we, and we go forward. And then after we do that, we can do this last part, which is to make a difference. Make a difference. Where we say, I'm really contributing and making a difference and changing people's lives and doing it for eternity. Here's the thing is, is that making a difference is all about doing something that lasts into heaven. Not all causes are equal. So we need to be careful about that. And so we, so let's, so I want to unpack this now. I've kind of gone through this. These are the, these are the four things, but I want to go backwards now because here's why. I like to start with the end in mind. 
In other words, if you're trying to go somewhere, you say, where do I want to be? Stephen Covey talks about this in his book, you know, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He says, think about what you want to say. He goes, think about your funeral and what you, the four import, most important people in your life, what you, they would want, what you would want them to say about you. Write that down and then start living towards that. So you start with the end in mind. Now, I would start even farther than your funeral. Start with eternity. Because the Bible says that God created us as eternal beings. And so we want to start with eternity. What do we want God to say about us? And so you start way out of the beginning and say, God, how can I make a difference? And so, so that's, that's what it all starts with. And, and as I said, there's lots of different causes to give your life to. But your life will only be as successful as the cause you give it to. There's plenty of second-class causes that people give first-class effort to. I mean, they give their whole life, they go hog wild on something that doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things. Now, here's the deal. When it comes to vision, when it comes to a plan for your life, God has a plan for your life. He loves you. He's a living and loving God. He loves you. He cares about you. He wants your life to make a difference. But you know, there's also a counterfeit plan. Satan does not want you to do God's plan for your life. He wants the opposite. He has a, the world has a counterfeit plan. And, 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 and if you're unclear on God's plan for your life, you can easily get distracted and fall for the world's plan, for the world's vision. For example, instead of knowing God, it would all be about knowing me. You know, I want to know him. It's all about me. And I want to do what's best for me. And social media really feeds into this. I love social media. We use it a lot here in the church. I use it personally. I have a lot of fun with it. But social media can be one of those a catalysts for people to be very focused on themselves and not on the needs of other people. And so the same thing, instead of finding freedom, uh, th then, uh, you know, Satan, he's got, uh, uh, you know, his own plan for you. And it, it, it's not finding freedom. But it's, it's, it's finding fame. You know, I want to be, be famous. I want to I have some kind of uh, recognition. I want people to think I'm important. And f instead of discovering my purpose, it would be I've got to have a platform. I need a platform. If I can get a platform, you know, then I can, I can, I can you know, people will see how special I am. And then instead of making a difference, oh, I want to make some money, make a dollar. And so there's a counterfeit. And, and Satan tries to promise things that he can't deliver. See, God promises things. He says, you'll make a difference. You'll be satisfied. You'll have real joy this way. When you, when you make a difference and you impact people's lives, it's going to really count for eternity. But see, this other one, it'll promise something it cannot deliver. So there's the, always a counterfeit. Now, when it comes to making a difference, ultimately it comes down to serving, serving other people. Got to serve other people. It's going to be about others. Uh, about a week and a half ago, I was filling up my gas, and my, you know, at, at a gas station. And I was in my own little world, I guess. And some lady, she's right next to me. She's on the other side of the pump. And she goes, hey, could, uh, could you spare $5 to put some gas in my tank? She had a truck, and, and there was like one of the win side windows was bashed out. And I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. So I, I walk over there. I just, I filled up her tank. She goes, oh, you don't have to do that. I said, hey, no, it's, it's, I'm happy to do it. And then afterwards, I said, hey, could, she goes, thank you so much. I said, hey, could I, you know, I'm a Christian. Could I pray for you? She goes, sure, I'd love that. And so I prayed for her, and I think the Holy Spirit really touched her. She kind of was teared up a little bit, and we kind of talked a little bit, and then she drove off. So I was able to help her with her practical needs, with her spiritual needs. But, you know, when you, when you help other people that are in need, it it, it feels good. It, 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 you're making a difference. And when we do this together, something even more powerful happens. You know, they call it synergy. Synergy is when, when uh, you have multiple people come together, two or more, they have this multiplying effect. I don't know if you know this, but this is why they yoke animals together. One horse can pull a thousand pounds. Two, when you have two horses that are yoked together, they can pull not 2,000 pounds, but 10,000 pounds. I don't know if you knew that. That's the whole point. And you go, well, how does that happen? Well, one horse by itself cannot pull 5,000 pounds. But two horses together can pull 10,000 pounds. And this is synergy. It's when you, when you, when you pull together. See, some people want to be solo Christians. I'm just going to do my own thing. I, I don't need a team. I don't need to be part of something. 
But listen, you'll only be able to pull 1,000 pounds. See, together we can do something greater than we can do individually. That's why we come together. That's why Jesus gave us the church. The church we come together. He gave some, if you read scripture, you start realizing, wow, we have some pretty big mandates, some pretty big goals that Jesus set for us. They cannot be accomplished alone. We need each other. We need, and that's why we're, we come together, we're the dream team. We really are the team that comes together and we make the dream uh, a reality. So this is a big part of making a difference. Jesus said it this way. He said, um, actually, I skipped this first. Let me, it says, I keep asking, this is talking about vision. He goes, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. This is part of the vision that we know him. And then he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. So uh, what I wanted you to see there is, is that hope and calling go together. You, you, our hope comes from understanding our calling, that we're supposed to make a difference. Some people think that their hope comes, you know, if I can only get rid of this problem I have. I have this terrible problem, and if I can only get rid of it, then I'll have hope. Listen, life is just exchanging one set of problems for another set of problems. We'll always have problems. You go, Andy, you're so negative. Can't you be more positive? Well, here, I'll be positive. I'm positive you'll always have problems. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it goes, right? It's just... So we, we have to recognize that that's not where we're going to root our hope in. Our hope is, is when we discover our calling, we're supposed to make a difference. We're supposed to make a difference. And then here's I was the verse I was going to point to that Jesus said. I love this. Uh, he says, uh, he talks about this area of making a difference. He says, this is my father's, this is to my father's glory that you should bear much fruit. He's talking about eternal fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. And he says, I have told you this so that your joy may be, so you may have joy and that your joy may be complete. See, complete joy, the secular sociologists call this transcendence. In other words, you know you're living for something beyond yourself. And Jesus says, Jesus was saying that 2,000 years ago. He's saying you do need to live for something beyond yourself. You live to make a difference in other people. And uh, that's really where uh, our joy comes from. So we don't allow ourselves to get veered off. And, and as I said again, the church does this most effectively together when we're unified. When the early church was launched, it wasn't just with Peter preaching at this, on the steps, of the, the southern steps in Jerusalem. It was the team. The whole team came together. And you see that over and over, that the team came together and made that dream a reality as the early church was exploding. And Satan hates a unified church because the gates of hell can't prevail against that. So he's always trying to cause strife and division and anything that's unified. You'll notice this in James 3.16. It says, for where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. The word strife, other translations call it rivalry, contention, factious, self-interest. <clears throat> so this is Satan's strategy is to cause strife. He'll do that in your own home. <coughs> Excuse me, some of you know that. In your own home, you got strife. Well, there's there's a spirit behind that. Satan likes that. He wants that to happen. He doesn't want you to be unified in your home. He doesn't want you to be unified in your marriage. And it's true in the church that he wants strife. He wants break. Now, I'm so thankful. Sharon and I started this church 23 years ago. We've never had any kind of church split or anything like that. And that's God's grace. And I'm so thankful for that. We've worked hard to try to make sure that never happened. I know many people that over the years have come up to me. Oh, I came from a church. It split. It was so painful. I'm sure it was. When families split, it's painful. It's always painful. And Satan tries to win at that game. And so our, our, our vision, no, we're going to do it together. We're going to be unified. We're going to make a difference. But that can't happen if you don't know your purpose. So knowing your purpose is very important. And that's what we talk about being trained, dis trained to discover your purpose, which is a big part of growth track. Growth track is our training where we say, okay, this is <clears throat> for people to figure out their purpose. Now, some of you, you're not clear on your spiritual gifts and what God's given you. And, and, and sometimes we, we kind of morph and in different seasons it looks differently. Some of you, you knew it, but it, sometimes it's, ha it's good to have a, a refresher and say, okay, l let me just sign up for this one more time, you know, and, 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 and be committed. And this is a big part of growth track is where we're being trained to figure out, okay, now I know what I'm here for. I know what I'm called to do. Ephesians 6 says this, talking about being effectively trained. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Put on the full armor of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's scheme. So God has plans for you. The devil certainly is scheming to uh, veer you off into a counterfeit plan. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now, there's, just, there's this cosmic spiritual battle going on. But against, and, and, and this struggle is against rulers, authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, even the heavenly realms. And then there's a list of things that we need to do, that, uh, this, this, this spiritual armor. Very, very important. But I wanted to hone in on one. It's an offensive, what all the other armor are, are kind of like defensive, uh, defensive pieces of armor. This one is, uh, in verse 17, is our one offensive thing. So if we're, gonna, if we're going to uh, discover our purpose, we need to take up what he calls the sword of the Spirit. So he says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is what? He says, it's the Word of God. This is God's Word. The, uh, the, the Holy Scriptures. This is part of getting a biblical worldview, a mindset. How do you get that? How do you get, I mean, most of us, if you were not raised in a, in a Christian home, you were raised in, with a world, a world mindset. How do you transition that into where you have a God-centered mindset, a, a, a biblical mindset? Well, you got to get the Bible in you. You got you to read it. You got to discover it. It's got to change your life. It's got, it's got a, it's, it, it equips you to do the, the, the calling that God's called you to do. It's part of uh, what brought me here to Virginia. I actually am from Tucson, Arizona. And uh, God called me into ministry uh, halfway through college. And so I thought it was just going to be there in Arizona. So I did some apprentice classes. I graduated from the University of Arizona. I was all ready to go. Uh, I was looking at different church options. And I had a dream. I had a dream where I was in this cosmic battle. And I was fighting uh, the forces of evil, and I had, you know, Christians along beside me, and, and Satan comes up right over me, and he starts laughing. I grab my gun to shoot him. I think, hey, I'm going to take him down. There's the big guy. <laughs> and he starts laughing even harder, and I, like, really start to get nervous. Why is he laughing? He's laughing so confidently. This is all in my dream now. And I look down at my gun. It turns out I really don't have a gun. All I have is, like, a, a rifle scope. It's just, a sco- it's just something to look through. I actually have no power. And so I wake up, and I'm like hyperventilating. It was so real to me. I, what in the world was that? You know, and I prayed, and I felt like God said, Andy, you have vision, but you lack power. And he was pointing, and then as I prayed about it, he said, you, you, even though I'd read the Bible a number of times, and he goes, you don't really have a biblical mindset. You lack the, the God's word in you. So that, and through a process of prayer, that led me out to Virginia to go to Regent University, I end up getting a Master of Divinity. Now, that's not going to be, for most of you, that won't be your, your pathway. That was mine, though. But, it, but the principle is still the same, f- friend. It is you need God's Word in you. <coughs> you need that. And it's, it's, it's your weapon. It's, he says it's the sword of the Spirit. Now, it's, you know, in those days, they didn't have Uzis, right? They didn't have the kind of weaponry we have today. Sword was one of the most primary weapons, but there's other weapons. There was spears. You could throw a javelin. You had, you had artillery like slingshots. This is what King David did. Remember, he, he took down Goliath with a slingshot. You know, with that rock. <coughs> that was not like a kid's toy. That was an actual way to, to, uh, to go into battle. And he had already killed a bear and a lion. He thought, hey, man, those, you know, if I can kill a bear and a lion. This guy, look at him. He's got this huge, you know, opening right on his head. However... Goliath was just jeering him, and even his own people, some of the Israelites, they were mocking him, saying, you can't do it. Look at how small you are. Look at how big he is. But this was his weapon that he had honed in, and he knew how to use it. And as you know the story, he, he, he was victorious. When it comes to your offensive weapon, it will always involve God's Word. How you, how you uh, integrate that into your life will probably look different than, than many other people. Some people are great memorizers. And they think everybody should be great memorizers. And you, then all you do is just feel bad. And say, well, I guess I'm just not supposed to read it. No. Some people are fast readers. Some people, uh, th- you know, love to journal. That's their thing. And then they think everybody should journal. No, not everybody. That works for you. And I'm glad it works for you. You need to do it. But not everybody journals. Some people, they like to take walks. And they'll just... Uh, they'll just meditate on some verses and they'll pray and, and meditate. Some people, they like to pray in the shower or w- when they're in their car and then they, they have maybe on their sun visor a, a verse that they think about. 
It'll look different for you. Maybe you listen to audio books and you like to listen to the God's Word on audio. Make it work. Just don't ignore it. You need to have something that works for you. If you're going to be trained, if you're going to uh, discover your purpose, it's going to involve God revealing who He is and who you are through His words. Uh, it says the weapons, notice there in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons we fight are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. When we start to discover God's word, it starts to break up strongholds in our lives. These, these habits that hold us back. That's, starting next week, we're going to do a series on uphill habits. In other words, some habits, it just seems like we're always pushing them uphill. We can never seem to get any traction. We're going to talk about that, how to break free from some of those nastier habits and get really set free. But ultimately, our freedom comes by going to God, letting God uh, uh, speak to us through his word and use that. And this is a big part. We're kind of working backwards now in the vision. This is a big part of being pastored, of, of being freed, set free. And if we're always looking back, always looking at our yesterdays, we can't move forward into our tomorrows. And sometimes it's really hard. It, things get us stuck in the mud. When I was praying about this this week, I had this um, memory of uh, my grandfather teaching me to fish when I was just a little tyke. He was a really great fisherman, so he, he would come. Uh, he lived in, in Indiana, so he'd fly out to see our family a couple times a, a year. And he'd take me to a lake and teach me to fish and, and, uh, and just, you know, put the hook in. And, you know, the hook, when you, when you, when you have a hook, uh, you put, of course, a piece of bait on it, but also it has a barb on it. A hook, if you're a fisherman, you know that's that the, on the end of a hook, it kind of goes backwards and it digs in really deep. In fact, when you catch your fish, if you're not careful, you can easily kill the fish, especially if he swallowed it down in there or it's in his gill. You kind of have to use your pliers and kind of work with it, not because of the hook, but because of the barb. The barb is kind of goes the opposite way and gets in there. The, if, if you're not careful, the fish will bleed to death. And so that's what happens. Satan does the very same thing to us. He offers us something that so many of us, it's temptation, right? We've all fallen to temptation. But we fall for it because it, we believe it at the time. Satan offers it, says, hey, if you do this, you'll feel better about yourself. The pain will go away. You'll have pleasure that you deserve this. You're important. You're, you know, and it, all of these things. And then we get it, we, we, we ingest what he says, and then it's like stuck, and it's still there. And, and how do you get that out? We have to, you know, sometimes those barbs, they only come out with the help of other people. God has designed in his methodology, the way we get freed is not all by ourselves. We wish it was that way. Yeah, I did it all by myself, you know, self-made person. But it's just not reality. The way God has designed it is, is we need each other. We help each other. And uh, look at this verse here. Great verse uh, describing how this works. James 5, he says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other, not to God. There's another place where he says confess it to God, but here he confess it to each other and pray for each other, what? So that you may be healed. See, this is a big part of why we need small groups, the power of a small group. This is, this is part of the way that God gives healing to us. We, we, we need to know God, but we find in small groups, we find freedom. And only after we find freedom can we discover our purpose and make a difference. And so when we're in a small group, this is not just a mini Bible study. A small group is not just a mini church service. You've already had that. You don't need that. In a small group, you find friends that care about you, people that you can be real with you. I mean, there's a lot of places where we can't really be real, right? It's not encouraged to be real. We won't get the prom promotion if we're really real with them. So when they say, how are you doing? You're expected to say, I'm fine. I'm good to go. But you're not. The truth is, you have some things in, in your life that need to be dealt with. And that's where, when we're in a small group, we can pray for one another. Confess one another. Hey, this is things I'm struggling with. And sometimes that's hard to do if you're not used to that. You know, if, you're, if you've never been in a healthy environment where it's safe to share and, and be yourself and take your mask off, that's new for a lot, for a lot of people. They're, you know, when you start coming to a small group, people ask you, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. No, really. No, I'm fine. I'm, I'm doing good. The truth is, all the way, you know, in the car, all the way to the small group, 
you were cursing and yelling and fighting with your spouse and screaming. I mean, just, but then it's time to put the mask on, right? Listen, God wants us to have people we work together with. And he uses that to bring healing in our life. You got to be willing to, to step into that. And so this is why small groups are so important. It's such an, a vital part of what we do. This is, hey, I'm going to be part of, of, uh, of, of the vision of the church because this is, this is the vision God has for me. So if we're going to make a difference, we, that, which is where joy is found. We got to first know why we're here. We need to know what our purpose is. And the only way we can know our purpose is by finding freedom, by, dis, by, 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 by following the, our good shepherd and being pastored. But all of that begins with knowing God. We can't, we can't even get off the dead center without knowing God. Having a personal relationship with God. Letting God speak to us. Letting God, you know, empower us with his Holy Spirit. Notice this last verse there. It talks about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple and deny themselves and take up their cross, they need to take up their cross and follow me. This is a, you know, he's setting, he's setting the standard. He goes, it's a big deal. It's not going to be easy a lot of times. He goes, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Jesus says, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. In other words, if you want to opt out, if you want to say, I'm going to do it on my own, I'm not going to follow Christ. I'm not going to put my faith in Christ. I'm going to just try to do this on my own. He says, you know what? In the end, you're going to lose it regardless. All of us die, right? I mean, there's, you're going to lose your life. I mean, that has not changed. The mortality rate is still 100%. So even if you eat organic, you're going to die, right? There's just no stopping that. But some will lose their life, and that's it. Others, because they lose their life for Jesus and the gospel's sake, will gain it. What does that mean? Is that Jesus can do more in your life if you, if, than you can do on your own. If you, if you say, God, I want... I'm going to surrender my life. I'm going to invite your presence in. I'm going to, I want your guidance. I want your help. I, I, want to, I want to know you and what you can do for me. I want to make a difference for eternity, not just what the world offers, not some counterfeit vision. When you start to do that, then God says, watch what I can do through your life. Watch what I can do through a small group, through like training like with the, with the growth track through being part of a dream team where you're making a difference and you're pooling our resources and we're saying we're going to do something that impacts people for eternity here in our city, beginning in our home and then really all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's bow our heads and pray. <clears throat> now, we're just going to take a moment <clears throat> and reflect. This is the beginning of 2018. This is a good time to kind of review, take a moment and refocus our vision. If you're online, I encourage you to do the very same thing. Just kind of say, God, where am I at in this vision? Where am I at in, in, in my spiritual steps? Some of you, your next step is to just be part of the dream team. Take growth track, get involved. Certainly you have individual ways that you serve as God show, reveals things to you in your community, in your home, but also corporately. For others of you, it's just going through, you, know, you haven't taken growth track and you need to be trained or you need to get in a small group and you need to say, I need to, I, I want to be, I want to be freed from some stuff. I hope you come to the uphill habits we're going to do. But I believe God wants to free you. Some of this just comes from a spiritual decision that can begin today. When that barb is in there. And you've lived with it so long, you think, I guess it's just there for good. Well, that's not, that's not God's best for you. God wants you to find freedom. But it begins with knowing God. So it may be, maybe you're here and you're far from God or you don't know him, I'm going to ask you and invite you to pray with me. Or maybe you're fuzzy on it. Maybe you've drifted away. And if you know him, this would be a prayer to know him better. Okay, so if you 
Say, God, if you want to be included in that prayer and say, you know what, 2018, I want to know him. I want to know him better. Then I invite you just in your mind just to pray with me or right where you're at. You say, dear God, today I want to put my faith in you. Give me your strength. Give me your power. Help me to realize my hope is found in you. And then say, I believe, Jesus, that you were crucified, buried, and that you rose again. That you died for me. So today I confess my sins to you. I say, God, forgive me. And then would you say, God, give me the courage to confess my sins to somebody else so I can receive healing. Not everybody. That's not wise, but somebody else who can pray for me and I can start those steps of finding freedom. Lord, I pray that you help us to make a difference in a great way in 2018, even more than we did in 2017. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.